Speed when he was born, as he tells us, on the Sunderland of this monastery here, um, was born into an area that was quite heavily settled by the Anglo-Saxons. The part of Northumbria they really liked best to settle in were these rich coastal lands, but, uh, particularly by the river mouths. And they had settled, building their timber houses here, sometimes among Roman ruins, sometimes just near to Roman sites. It was a world uh, that he was going to see as something quite different later. Bede was, as the story has it anyway, born within the monastery grounds here and entered the monastery at the age of seven, his parents giving him into the care of the abbot, Benedict Biscop. And he became a monk here and later a deacon and then at the age of 30 a priest, sharing his time between Wearmouth and Jarrow. Biscop, the first abbot of St Peter's Wearmouth and uh, St Paul's in Jarrow, Biscop was a traveller. He'd been to Rome many times. He carried on going to Rome while he was abbot here, so he was hardly ever here, really. So Bede would have known him as the absent father figure, I think. His parents had entrusted him, the young Bede, to uh, Biscop's care. But it would have been Cholfrith who would have looked after him, really. Cholfrith was his mentor, Cholfrith his teacher. Cholfrith, uh, Benedict's second in command, if you like, and the man who was uh, ultimately to succeed Benedict as abbot here. Benedict Biscop was very much the innovator. Uh, he'd seen churches on the continent and he very much wanted to build a church and a monastery in that style here. It was Biscop who brought the stonemasons and the glaziers from abroad to build here in, in the Roman style. He brought the furniture, he brought John the Archchanter from the Vatican to teach the monks to sing. He was the innovator, the man who did things for the first time, uh, full of energy, starting things off. But Cholfrith more the consolidator, really, uh, the man who built on Biscop's achievements. He built the place up, doubled the size of the library. It was he who really settled it down and turned it into the sort of place where the young Bede could become the great scholar he became. Bede so admired Abbot Chelfrith and respected his teachings that he wrote the story of his life. This was copied by monks for various libraries and an early medieval copy of it survives to this day. The life of Chelfrith, uh, not by Bede, by the anonymous monk of, of uh, Wearmouth Jarrow. And this is one of only two copies that survive. This one was written in the 10th century, so it's a, a relatively late copy. Um, for both the authors of Lives of Chelfrith, Chelfrith must have been an outstanding influence. Uh, he must have been the mentor. He was the head of the community, the great um, example that they looked up to, and the most important person around at the time, in fact. As we know so little about Bede from his writings, to get a clearer picture of the man, his life and his times, we rely upon the work of archaeologists. We know most about the Anglo-Saxons uh, by, I, I hope I'm not partial in saying this, by archaeology. Although place names tell us where they settled, they don't tell us what their settlements looked like, what their houses looked like, and uh, what their economy was, what they ate and drank and so on. But archaeology slowly is piecing together a picture, and it's taken a long time, you know, it's taken the last 30, 40 years to understand how the Anglo-Saxons were living in this area. You know, when I first came here to Wilmoth, this site was covered in, in a town. It was part of a townscape. There was only a little gap between the church and the houses that ran right down here to the river. And uh, so to begin with, we had to dig in the roads and in people's backyards. And my brief solely was to find out if anything was left of the monastery the Venerable Bede had inhabited. And as I didn't know what it was going to look like anyway, it was going to be quite different to spot it. Also, as a town had destroyed a lot of it on the surface, it was also difficult to spot it. But gradually we pieced together a picture and it gave us a very remarkable picture because Bede himself had said that the founder of this monastery wished to bring to the north something different, something that wasn't the timber buildings that he had been living in, but he wished to build in the Roman manner which he had seen in his extensive travels on the continent. And that, very amazingly, is exactly what we found. King Egfrith was so impressed with the success that uh, Benedict Biscop had had at Wearmouth 
but he made him an additional grant of land, this time on the banks of the Tyne. And that's where St Paul's Jarrow stands now. And so a second monastery was founded at St Paul's in Jarrow. Cholfrith was its first abbot and was sent there with a number of monks, we think including Bede. Perhaps, you know, if you come to Wearmouth now, you might be slightly disappointed at how little you can see of what remains of the 7th century. Because this site was the main site of Benedict and Cholfrid's um, Anglo-Saxon monastery. Be called it the larger of the twin monasteries. It was uh, laid out in concrete uh, in the Roman manner and now all you can see of the technique of construction is the west wall of the church and the lower portion of the tower, which was originally its entrance porch. It would have been, I think, a great cultural shock for somebody like Bede, having lived in warm, fuggy timber buildings, to come and live in these perhaps rather cold, cool stone buildings are, that were constructed for Wilmoth Jarrow. St Paul's Jarrow, as you know, is one of the twin foundations, St Peter's, Mount Wearmouth and St Paul's Jarrow. And those dedications were tremendously significant for Benedict Biscop because they were the princes of the apostles whose shrines he'd visited in Rome. And so they weren't picked at random. And it's very important that uh, the dedication stone here is for the basilica, which is St Paul's for the church. And the dedication stone, indeed, you can still see, although it's in a different place from where it was originally. Biscott seems to have spent his entire life travelling around Europe collecting things. Manuscripts, books, paintings, even craftsmen, the stonemasons and the glassmakers. He even got the new practitioners of that Gregorian chant. You can imagine a young bead watching the construction of the new monastery. Biscop had been given land to construct a second monastery here at Jarrow. Well, these lines in the ground indicate where the stone walls stood, and this dates from a much later monastery. But what is important here at Wearmouth and Jarrow is that unlike the wooden world of Aden and Cuthbert, Bede's world is dominated by stone. When Wearmouth and Jarrow was founded, the intention of its founders was that it should be something different in the north. Um, they wanted to make it a centre of learning where the uh, inhabitants stayed in their monastery and formed a little world of their own. Whereas the Celtic monasteries of Lindisfarne and Aden's foundations had been places from which the monks went out as missionaries. I think it would be true to say that it's not just the fact that these churches are built of stone that is the reason they've survived over 1300 years. I think it's also because of the devotion that very quickly arose to Bede himself and the veneration that we, in which he's been held. And the fact that Jarrow was refounded as a daughter church of Durham, I think you could see as being a result of the fact that Bede has been a very popular and venerated saint. And of course that's reflected in the fact that he is a doctor of the, the church, that means a teacher of the faith, and that he is kept in the calendar in places far beyond his native land and is a name that will be recognised throughout the world. By the time of Bede, Northumbria was no longer dependent on wandering bands of Celtic monks. Christianity had firmly become entrenched in the landscape of Northumbria. Another example of this are the plethora of stone-built buildings and churches as opposed to the Celtic tradition, which used mainly wood. However, there are some notable exceptions, and this is one. The church here at Escombe, near Bishop Auckland, a Saxon church built in the Celtic tradition, but using stone, and probably predates Bede himself. Miraculously, it still survives for us today. Before the church was a, a Christian place of worship, it is likely to have been used as a pagan worship site. Uh, many of these early Celtic sites were taken over and built upon by the Christian church when, when it arrived. Uh, the date we roughly reckon is about 670 to 690 uh, AD. The early architectural features that you should look for in this church are the, the, the smaller windows which are splayed inwards with round tops and square tops 
and, and these speak of the earliest uh, pattern of Northumbrian church architecture. You also need to look at the height and the length and the pattern of the church, particularly the way that the sanctuary is not tied on to, to the main building. And this is characteristic of, of Celtic Northumbrian uh, church architecture. Why I think Eskom is so special is that it speaks today of the living Celtic tradition. Uh, there you, you see not a fossil of the past, but you see something which is, tells you of a continuity through history, uh, which is part one of this idea of continuity and things which interlink. It also has this sense of circularity and wholeness, that the, 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 the parson, the people and the place are one. And when people come here, they often expect to find, uh, they come looking for cobwebs and they actually find a living, alive church. Now, some people go away saying, what we want is the past, but the Celtic vision that is here is the past, the present, and the future are one. Bede was clearly a product of the Northern Church after the Synod of Whitby. He wholeheartedly embraced Roman Orthodoxy. Indeed, his writings were critical of the early Celtic saints. He called them ignorant of the so-called knowledge. But despite his pro-Roman stance, Bede was growing up in a world with a strong Celtic resonance. Bede was an elusive man, but reading between the lines of his own writings, we can get more than just a flavor of his own beliefs. I was ordained a deacon at the age of 19 and priest at the age of 30, on both occasions through the ministration of the Reverend Bishop John and at the bidding of Abbot Chelfrith. From the time of my entering the priesthood until my 59th year, I have made it my business for my own and my brother's use to compile brief notes on the Holy Scriptures extracted from the works of the Venerable Fathers and to make additional comments to clarify their meaning and interpretation. I think Bede would have seen his scholarly work both on history and also on scripture and other things as being very much in the context of a whole monastic life. I think if you'd asked him, he'd have said that his first vocation was to be a monk, a priest, and that that was, a very, that was indivisible from the rest of his life. But within that context, he was able to use his gifts of his scholarship um, to give God glory in that particular way, as other brothers would have done in different aspects of life. Bede is important in to, to the northerner in the sense of it's the kind kind of pride we have with with Brendan Foster, the pride we have with uh, you know Newcastle football team. We we have we have a uh, it gives it gives the the northerner uh, some degree. I, I would argue a degree of status. What we know about the Middle Ages, we get from Bede. Cuthbert, Cuthbert represents um, a very, very strong uh, consciousness about the environment. It's a kind of Friends of the Earth, uh, Greenpeace lobby virtually. Now that makes him highly relevant, very, very uh, modern. He's a man for all seasons. He's a man for our time. With Bede, it was, it was the, it was the, uh, the historian aspect which interested me, the scholar. See, it, it's not sufficient just to carve an image of the man. The, the significance of the bead carving and the Cuthbert carving is that they, they represent uh, ideas. I've still got to get a hold of the, the, the content before I can reach for image. When Benedict and Chalfred founded these monasteries, they brought together a remarkable group of not just teachers, uh, but of craftsmen and specialists as well. They had to get specialists in certain crafts, such as the making of glass windows or the making of mortared stone buildings from the continent, from friends that, uh, and acquaintances they have made in their travels over there. The monastery also had one of the best libraries, if not in early medieval Europe, certainly in England of the time. Uh, Benedict Bishop and Chailfrith, who's the first abbot of Jarrow, 
travelled to the continent, particularly Benedict Bishop, a number of times and brought back books which would have been otherwise destroyed and uh, for this library and of course monks like Bede um, were able to use them for their own researches and writings. Um, apart from that, I suppose you can build up a picture of him from some of the other things that he wrote. Um, I think he would have been a very precise person, almost a pedant perhaps, um, in, in wanting everything to be absolutely so. He was very, very concerned to have accurate translations of work and indeed it was absolutely essential to his scholarship. He was very, very well respected. I think the feeling that, that the other monks in the monastery had for him and, and the respect that the outside world had for him tell you quite a lot about him. Of the huge number of literary works that Bede produced, the majority of these were biblical commentaries. And this is what he was primarily known for during his own lifetime. He also produced a number of lives, such as that of Chalfrith and, of course, Cuthbert. But the work that ensured the survival of his fame was his Ecclesiastic History of the English. And because it was a history, Bede is remembered as the first English historian. But this wouldn't have been how he saw himself. I'm sure Bede would have seen himself as an interpreter of the scriptures. And in fact, we know about his reputation because after his death, St Boniface, the great English missionary to the Germans, wrote to the abbot of Jarrow asking for copies of Bede's scriptural commentaries in which he talks of Bede the priest who lately shone among you as a candle of the church. Well, this manuscript is a copy of Bede's Ecclesiastical History. Uh, it's the third oldest one. It was written within about 20 years of Bede's death. So obviously that is of very great interest for Jarrow because this is where we assume that it was made. Bede was trying to write a history of the church in England and he was trying to write it for a particular purpose and for his own particular period. He was looking back in some ways to what he saw as being a golden age of achievement which contrasted with his own period. It's a rather uh, specialised uh, viewpoint uh, but it was one that informs the whole of that history. This book, in fact, takes us back to our roots, our Anglo-Saxon roots. Uh, we're very privileged to have so much detailed information about this period, which is such is 1,300 years ago, after all, when you think about it in arithmetical terms. Uh, and Bede knew a lot of the people who were involved in his story, and I think he makes this come alive for us, uh, as nothing else in the Middle Ages comes quite to life. Not for me, anyway. Bede obviously had an agenda behind his ecclesiastical history, just as the, the writers of the lives of St Cuthbert and uh, St Wilfred also had an agenda behind their history. Bede uh, wanted to show, first of all, the, uh, the roots of Northumbrian Christianity, but he also uh, was concerned in his own period about what he saw as being the collapse, in some ways, of the church. From the simple beginnings of Aden, through a time span of less than a hundred years, the Northumbrian church had grown exceedingly wealthy. Even just a few months before his own death, Bede had written to his great friend Egbert of York, bemoaning these false monasteries and the decline due to riches and avarice. Throughout his life, Bede was committed to the Church of Rome. But what must he have felt at the slackness and corruption that was creeping into his beloved church? It's almost as if at the end of his life he was looking back at the high ideals of a previous age, an age dominated by the shining examples of Aidan and Cuthbert. Fitting then that on his deathbed, Bede was writing a translation of St John's Gospel, that mystical gospel so loved by the Celts. The only other account that we have of him is on his, about his death, in fact, written by the young monk Cuthbert, who later became the abbot of the monastery and who, who nursed him and helped him to... He recorded uh, Bede's translation into English of St John's Gospel. St John's Gospel is very different to the first three Gospels. It's a more mystic Gospel. It's a more heavenly-centred Gospel. And... The Celts liked it because I think you really can use your imagination an awful lot more within it. And it was a gospel of very great depths. They all have depths, but it has a stranger depth as St John. Perhaps that's why the symbol is the eagle. The eagle is the bird that soars so high. 
and this gospel does the same. The last king of Northumbria, Chelwulf, died here on Lindisfarne, 764 AD. There followed a great winter, the snows lasting well into spring. And then, on the horizon, the first Viking longships appeared. Over the next few years, the Vikings systematically sacked and destroyed all the great monasteries, putting paid to the flowering of Christianity in the north. But the fact that we know so much about the golden age of Northumbrian Christianity is mainly thanks to the work of the Venerable Bede. His contribution is recognized today at Bede's World in Gerald. The main idea is that the Venerable Bede uh, is uh, a venerable person who's not received the press that he, he should have done. Uh, and we're very much in the veneration business here. We're trying to do something uh, which is not only correct in a historical sense, but actually also venerates uh, a great man who happened to be a local man. So the idea is that we have a modern building which gives this impression of an early Christian monastery. Now the point of that is, is not just to be clever or she-she, it's actually plays straight back to Bede because one of the great things, one of the great kickoffs they had in 680 was uh, that they brought not just ideas from the Roman civilized world, but they brought actual people, in particular masons, uh, glassmakers and so on. So these new techniques, we, or these techniques which had been lost from Roman Britain, were brought in by real people. It's not just an idea traveling, real people actually came. We're trying to provide physically, botanically, archeologically, uh, something of the scene which Bede would have looked out on. I always like to think of him as the, if you like, the first of the genuine Europhiles. Uh, and I think that makes him very relevant actually to today because at that time, and I hope this is one of the messages people will get here, at that time, 680, 700, this was not a marginal area. We're so used to thinking of ourselves as marginal. You know, we're, we're so far from London. London didn't matter in 680. Uh, it, it was not the center of the universe. This was the center, one of the centers, of Western Europe. In this tomb are the bones of the Venerable Bede. So reads the epitaph carved on a slab of blue marble here in the Galilee Chapel of Durham Cathedral. Bede died on Ascension Eve in the year 735 AD of poor health, having dictated with his last dying breaths the end of St. John's Gospel, his own translation. Legend has it that the mason carving this epitaph was stuck for a suitable adjective to describe Bede. So he downed his tools and left for the evening. And upon returning the next day, he found the word venerable had been written in the marble. Bede offers us a view of Christianity in his time and in his immediate past, giving us a glimpse of the world he lived in and the men and women of the church that inspired him, men such as Aidan and Cuthbert. And with our life of Bede, we really do complete our ABC of the Christian heritage of Northumbria. For the moment.